story. Mike Hawkins, the, the Awana missionary, we were walking back from the Family Life Center one day. He was here uh, at the church, and he was just kind of sharing some things about how he had been saved earlier, but he wasn't living for the Lord. And a man from the telephone company, remember the Bell Telephone Company people, they used to own the phone, and they'd come to your house when you had a problem. And that man said to him, are you saved? Oh, yes, yes, I'm saved. And that man must have been led by the Holy Spirit. And he said to Mike, well, Mike, do you love the Lord? And Mike said, uh, he said, yes, but he said he knew in his heart what he really loved was hunting and fishing and all of that kind of stuff. And the Lord was somewhere way in the back mirror, in the, in the back of all of that. And so the Lord did a work for him and he went to that man's church and uh, rededicated his life. And he said, you know, he said, he said, I got so busy in church, he said, every time they'd ask me to do something, I'd say yes. So he said, the way to grow is just keep saying yes. And uh, what a wonderful man Mike Hawkins really is. Lost his wife recently, and if you know Mike, it'd be good to pray for him. All right, well, we do welcome you to the class. We want to do that, and we have, we'll go over our prayer list uh, t- uh, this morning. But first of all, we want to look at our birthdays. And we have uh, B. Willis today would be her birthday. And I talked to her daughter, um, uh, Debbie, and said uh, certainly wish her happy birthday and let her know the Joy class loves her. She's failing a little bit in different areas, as you can well imagine. And also, Mrs. Caroline uh, Shockley is, uh, has a birthday today. Is that right, Miss Caroline? There you go. This is Miriam's mother. You probably know that. Some of you may not, but uh, glad to have you uh, in the class today, and happy birthday to you. And then coming up, I think I see Trudy back here. She's got a birthday coming up on, what is that, Friday? Okay, all right. And she is a cook, uh, cake cooking lady. I don't know, are you baking yourself a cake? <laughs> you could. I know uh, whether you will or not, you could. She is a great cook. Also, Bev Smith that's in Larry's class with a birthday coming up uh, also. Okay, so we're grateful for that. Tonight we have, uh, and welcome again, good to have you visiting with us uh, again. And uh, we'd love you to be just not a visitor, but uh, regular with us. Tonight we have three deacons that are going to be added to Lakeside, uh, Tim Littleton and Rick Krusner and Mark Baxley. So that's a a wonderful time in the life of our church to see them and to see them being ordained as deacons. And that's a big deal. It really is. That's a blessing. Thank you goes out to a couple of our men, that would be Jim and Joe Brown. Uh, I mentioned the widow that had a lot of leaves in her driveway and it's a sloped driveway and she has to go up that to get to her car. And they graciously went over this past uh, Thursday, I believe it was, And uh, they cleaned up those leaves and did such a good job. So thank you, man, for that. So, and from time to time, you know, we 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 have some guys in here that from time to time we may have a little project to do for a widow or someone that needs a little help, and to kind of nod your head if you would be interested, you know, able to do that. If some of you, I'm looking at heads now to see if they're nodding. (laughs) Okay. So anyway. But uh, there you go. If you're able, that's the way we would treat that. So let's see then. Let's go to our prayer list. If you have a prayer list, uh, we want to remember Pastor Tad, Amy, and Tyler Marshall. Certainly just uh, their weeks, you know, varies intensity and just things come up. And uh, they need our prayer for, for the Lord's strength and for wisdom. All of them, Amy and Tyler as well. And then Josh and Amy, our missionary couple in, with their kids in Japan, Jerry Gefeller, our missionary in Cape Verde. Then let's continue to pray for, <clears throat> excuse me, Jerome and Elaine Berenson. Um, he does all that he can. He's been here, you know, sometimes, but Steve said he's usually good for about one event a day, and uh, he's just pretty much... Um, tired out after that. Wayne and Sue, uh, so they're in the process of headed up toward Liberty. I understand your house supposedly is sold and they have a contract on a house and 
just for all those things to kind of keep in sync. So very good. Pray for them as they are moving up to liberty. Then uh, Sybil, continue to remember Sybil. Hello, hello, Miss Sybil. Good morning to you. Pray, continue to pray for Sybil. And we love you, and the joy class loves you, Sybil. Audra Finley, she has open heart surgery this Wednesday. Her sisters are helping. After the surgery, she'll go home and uh, be with the sisters for whatever time they think would be helpful. So we're grateful that she has help with them. By the way, she, she mentioned a nephew that she has. It. <clears throat> they found a, uh, like a mass in his lung, and so they're concerned about this nephew. That's Audrey Finley's nephew. Pray for Larry and Linda. Larry's teaching next door but for his AFib situation and Linda. Dewey Henderson, uh, Susan's dad, continue to remember him. And I believe your friend, it was it Robbie Milam, and uh, possibly cancer, a very good friend of, of Jody. Continue to remember uh, Pat Robertson, who had the oral surgery <clears throat> for Brother Marshall, Charlie Marshall. Continue to remember John L. Smith. We're glad that he's here today. And then uh, unspoken request, widows and wid widowers. Lynn Littleton's stepdad did pass away, so pray for her. The service will be this Tuesday, uh, about an hour and a half away toward um, the shore, I think it is, through Allendale, some on down that way in Farnville. And then also, let's see, Carol Alexander that the halls usually bring. She had uh, the heart, mild heart attack. Do you know if she's home yet? She's across the way. She's over in Oh, she's in the class. Well, good for her. We're glad she's been able to, to do that. All right, Brother Bobby, it's good to have him and Carolyn back today. Uh, that he's been at a church he pastored this past Sunday, and they had a good time, and it was um, a celebration for the church with 50 years, I think. Okay, thank you, Brother Bobby. And anything you would like to say? I would, pardon, we really appreciate your prayers and, and safety for us going there and back. It was a really, really a blessing. And uh, we just had a tremendous time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for being such an awesome Heavenly Father to us. And, Lord, I know myself, I'm so undeserving, but I thank you, Lord, for the privilege that I have to be a part of the family of God and mm -hmm. to be able to serve you. Bless today in the service here. Bless Brother John. Empower him and use him. And, Lord, would you pray for uh, Mr. and Ms. B that were mentioned. We're asking, Lord, that you'll strengthen them today. And, Lord, that he can do a little bit more than what he did yesterday. We just trust you and pray, pray for that, dear Lord, and for the widows and widowers and Lord, Miss Sybil needs your strength today and your comfort. And Lord, we do pray for her and the unspoken requests that are on hearts. Miss Audrey Finley, we pray for Lord this open heart surgery that she's faced with, and this loved one, Lord, that has this special need also. We pray for for this person, Miss Lynn Littleton, comfort and strengthen her heart and and her family. We Lord know your grace is sufficient. Brother Larry Haney, Lord, we're just praying that that you'll take and allow his heart to get back in the rhythm and strengthen to help him and also Miss Linda. We thank you for our pastor. We thank you for his family. We thank you for all of our staff and, and their families too. Lord, deal with the forces of evil to try to hinder and hurt them or this ministry in any kind of way, but may your power uh, be on the service today and, and bless him and Lord, all that they're doing too. And Ms. Pat Robertson, continue to touch and heal Lord her from this oral surgery. And, Lord, for all our new deacons, Lord, what a privilege it is to see this take place. I pray you'll bless them and help them and strengthen them through, Lord, this process. And, Lord, our church can be even stronger as we saw with these new leaders, too. And we pray for Brother John L. Smith. You continue to touch and help him. Lord, all of our shut-ins, they, they need your encouragement, Lord. Many are lonely, and I just pray that you'll comfort and strengthen them. We do pray for Miss Carol Alexander. Thank you for protecting her through this time, and Lord, heal her from this heart attack that she's had. And Lord, all of our missionaries, we thank you for all of them, Lord. And again, bless the music today. May it be Christ-honoring, and may your power be seen through the music. And we do pray for Wayne and Sue Boatwright, Lord. It's, it has to be very taxing to them, and we're going through this transition. 
Lord, give them strength and encouragement. Thank you, Lord, for how you're opening doors for them. We praise you for that. So may you get all the glory and honor today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Bobby. Oh, we're here in the book of Joel. That's one of the minor prophets. So if you, you uh, go through Ezekiel and all of that and Daniel, you'll come up on the minor prophet shortly after that. All right. Well, as you're turning there, there's a prayer request I would ask you to think about. Uh, you know, we can pray for little things as well as big things, and this may be a, a medium size. But uh, Richard's keeper needs an automobile. He's kind of shopping around looking for one. Let's pray that the Lord will help him find one. It would be just what he needs, you know? I think the Lord can do that, don't you? And uh, it just, just would meet his needs. All right, our topic today is the day of the Lord. We're in the book of Joel. It's three chapters. The day of the Lord is used uh, in prophecy about the Lord's return. It's not just the single day when the Bible talks about, and it does in a number of places, the day of the Lord. It's talking about uh, a series of events culminating in the promises and prophecies that he has made. Sometimes we'll say, well, um, that was their day, or, you know, and it's not necessarily a, a, just one day, but we're talking about a period. And this, this is end time stuff, the day of the Lord. We, as Gentiles, I think all of us in here are Gentiles. We're not Jewish. And we, as Gentile Christians, we more or less think of God in a, a relationship way, like an ind individual relationship way. And we should. That is, when we receive Christ as our Savior, God becomes our Heavenly Father. We can ask Him anything. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But many of our things that we rely upon in our beliefs are our individual relationship to Him. We're Gentiles, and we should think of that. We don't think of ourselves as being part of a temple where sacrifices are offered. We come to a church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he, he has. And so we as individuals, we come together, we hear preaching, we hear teaching, and we fellowship together, and we're equal. You know, there's no one bigger or better than anyone else. We're just equals in the family of God. So that's the Gentile picture. But we do realize there is another set of people, and that is the Jewish people. And in the Old Testament, well, before the Jewish nation happened, the world became so bad, it was like God says, okay, I'm going to take one family and we're going to start with this family and seek to produce a godly nation. And that one man was Abraham. And so God gave him a son, Isaac, and through Isaac and all that, and they multiplied. And then God said, I'm going to take them out of Egypt and I'll put them in a, a land of their land. And it's the land over there today, bordered with the Mediterranean Sea. Syria on one side, uh, Egypt down below, Lebanon up above, that land God gave to them. But you know, even the Jewish people, they fell by, it's in the scriptures, I'm not accusing them, it's, fell, it's in the scriptures how the Lord says they turned from him and that he sought them and he called them. And then finally he said, and I may show you the scripture at the end where he said he sent messengers to them and they mocked the messengers. And then the Lord says, till there was no remedy. Isn't that something? Till there was no remedy. And then the Lord said for that reason he was going to send him out into all nations. And yet he's not finished. You know, the Jews live in America. They live in South America. They live in... Uh, the European countries, they live, many live in Israel, but not all. They are around the world. But God says, I'm not finished, even though that's going to go on for centuries. God still has a plan for the people of Israel. And right now, they are not fulfilling his will. If you talk to the average Jewish person that lives in Israel, the average Jewish person is not a religious person. They know some of their history. 
if you talk to them about, well, tell me about Bethlehem. They can tell you about, oh, that's the, that's the city of David and oh, the shepherds. They can tell you all about that. But as far as David's God, the God that David said, he is my strength and I will rejoice in his salvation, they don't know of his salvation. And so even though they're in their land, that's their, that, I'm just telling you the way it is. I'm not, I'm not indicting them. I'm just revealing what Scripture says about them. And what they'll tell you if you ask them. They're some of the most liberal, you know, people that you'll, you'll run across. Even so, God is not finished with them. And in the day of the Lord, Joel here, Joel, this little book talks about the day of the Lord and a time when they will again be in their land, they will love God, and God will pour out his blessings on who? The nation. Now, we, we may live in America, and, you know, we can say it's a Christian nation. It was founded on Christian principles, but not everybody in America is a Christian, amen? We wish they were. And not every Christian really is, is sold out for God and, and keeping our nation from going down the path of ruin. But there's coming a time when in Israel, oh, there will be people that love God. And so that's the day of the Lord. Well, let's look at it now. So um, it's a minor prophet because it's a smaller book. This uh, is believed to have been written about 800 B.C. Schofield, if you have that, that's what he has for the date at the top of the book. And how can we apply this to us? Maybe you've never read uh, the book of Joel. Maybe you have. It's probably not, you know, somebody's favorite. Why should we be concerned about this? Because these matters matter to God. He's interested. He wrote it. So let's look at two main points. First of all is ruin foretold, ruin or destruction foretold, and then restoration, rest or rest, restoration foretold. So kind of half and half of the book. Look at verse 1, Joel 1.1. 1, 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Here's how scripture came about. It says the word of the Lord came to, to Joel. Joel didn't sit, sit down one day and say, you know, I think I'll write something that's kind of poetic. And, and they say, people that know Hebrew, this book of Joel, it's like reading Shakespeare. It's, it's just a beautiful style to it and the imagery. But even though he must have had, you know, maybe some education as a, as, a, as a person in the 800 B.C. area, what he wrote, verse 1 says, the word of the Lord came to him. David put it this way, that the word of God was in his tongue. 1 Peter 1.21 says, the scripture didn't come by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of God is the one that gives a message to the writer, and they wrote down what God wanted them to write. So this is uh, the word coming to him. His name, what does Joel, what does the name mean? It means the Lord is God. And somebody said Joel's name is a statement of faith of his parents. When they named him Joel, they were saying the Lord is, he is God. The Lord that Abraham knew, the Lord that said, I am that I am, he is God, not these other gods. And then his father's name meant, meant Pethuel meant persuaded of God. Don't you think people need to be persuaded of God? I think that's a good name. His dad had a good name as well, persuaded of God. So uh, two impending judgments that are coming, and one's locust and drought, and then we'll get into about the army. Look at verse 2, the telling of the things that are coming. Hear this, ye old men. Now, can somebody say amen right there? <laughs> Hear this. The Lord just gets down personal with us, doesn't he, Brother John? <laughs> Hear this, uh, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? He says, here is something that you haven't experienced before. Last year, we had a word that kept getting bounced up, and it was the word unprecedented. 
unprecedented. And this is what the Lord is saying was going to happen of all these locusts that are going to come. Verse 3, he says, Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. Question. Do you have any beliefs and values that are dear to your heart? Then if you do, you and I should pass them along to our children and try to seek that they pass them to their children. The values and our beliefs, we need to do that. And that's what the Lord was teaching them. Now, let's uh, go on. So first, who was to tell it? And we ought to pass things along as well. Of what? A coming um, plague of locusts, and that begins in verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust locust hath left, the canker worm uh, hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the caterpillar eaten. Have you ever on uh, TV, have you ever seen the news thing and they'll show a cloud of locusts coming across? Uh, it, we, you know, I could have shown some pictures up there, but it's just like a swarm. You know, what a, you know what a grasshopper is? We've all seen grasshoppers. Well, in a sense, that's what a locust is. And they can be very devastating. I think it was last year in Africa, uh, I saw pictures of people out with their gardens and their crops, and they were, they were trying their best to try to, to, to ward off the, the locusts. You know why? The things growing in that garden, that's, that's to fill their stomach for the coming year. And when, when you have a plague of locusts like this, and it's interesting, they say even something I, I just read this week, that whenever there's a drought, you know, and the locust population would be very low when there's a drought, not a lot of green. But as soon as the rain comes, it says something happens. Um, I guess it's like, you know, a hormone or something in the, in the locust. When rain comes, they sense it, and they just produce like crazy. The way, you know, God is, the, God is the God of wisdom, and he knows how things need to be done. So they, they'll, never, they'll never die off. They may be just a few, but boy, when the rain comes, poof. And so, but anyway, so he's saying that as a judgment, this was going to come there in verse 4. And so he says uh, in verse 5, the, the results. By the way, there, there are four things listed there in verse 4 about the locust. And I'm no expert on locusts, maybe you are, but they say these could be the different forms of the same insect, you know, so like a caterpillar form. There's a swarming, one word means swarming, and, and they do, you know, they swarm as a group. Another word was shearer, that where they're cutting and they, they're, you know, crawl, crawling, cut, whatever they come upon. Then verse 5, some of the people that will be affected he says, Awake ye drunkards and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. Verse 6, we're still talking about locust. For a locust, for a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of, li of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. Verse 7, he hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. And is, that's what a locust can do. When they come through in such a mass, they'll eat every leaf, every bloom. They will eat the little small twigs. They will eat the bark off the small twigs, what's left. And they can, they will, when they're, so voracious, they'll even eat the bark. And you know what happens to the plants? They die. They just die. They can't, they can't cope with that. You know, they talk about barking a tree. If you cut a circle around a tree, you'll kill the tree. It has to have a continuation of the bark. And so some of the people, uh, in verse 5, he talks about the drunkards that will howl because they have an addiction. You know, if they are addicted to alcohol, they always expect there will be alcohol. And you talk about desperate people, people that are addicted. Uh, my father, one time, when I was a teenager, there was a man uh, somehow related to the family, and he didn't have a place to live. 
And he was kind of a wino kind of guy. And my dad said, you can, you can, you can live in my brother's former room where my, uh, his brother had lived in the house. And he had his own little kind of little kitchen there. He said, you can live in our house, but he, he said, you can't drink. If you ever drink, he said, I have a son that lives here. If you ever drink, you know, you're going to have to go. Well, he lived with us for some time, and there was no problem. He had his own little income that came. And I came home one day, and he was not there. And I said, well, what happened to uh, this man? And he said, he was drinking. Well, when we cleaned up after he left, you know what we found? We found wine bottles under the bed, wine bottles in the closet, wine bottles under the house. And even though he knew that if he were caught drinking, he was going to have to go, he just wouldn't quit. Couldn't quit or wouldn't quit. Probably couldn't quit. And so you can imagine the effect here of these people that they don't have their drink. They'll just be, as he says, weeping and howling. It's, hey, can, can we just say to anyone who may be listening, it's better never to put something in your body that will take over your body that you can't quit. Now, I'll say <laughs> food, you know, you, you can't quite get away with that. You know, you, you, you're going to have to eat, and sometimes that's a habit too. I, I have the habit. Uh, we just have to watch what all we do, I guess. But anyway, enough of all that. That's, that's, we can go out of that. Well, uh, some of the effects, and we, we kind of need to move along here. Verse 8 talks about the, what the Lord is directing the people to do. He says, Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. It's just a sad time of this, this disaster coming on the land. Verse 9, not only um, just common people, but even the Lord's house would suffer. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. You know, the Lord says the rain comes on the just and the unjust. You know what? So does the drought. You know, we, when the world suffer, suffers, we, we suffer too. The good thing is, though, we got God we can lean on. And God does make a way in the wilderness. He does. We can trust Him. But we're talking about a prophecy... So here's the thing. Why are we talking about a plague of locusts? I think God likes to use object lessons. And so in this object lesson of this plague of locusts, the Lord is saying, this awful plague of locusts is like what's going to happen to nations at the end of time when they decide they're going to wipe Israel off the map. And that is coming. They're going to... The world is going to decide we're, we're, we're tired of that little, that little, na that little nation. And, and the Bible describes from Russia, from China. It says about 200 million. Can you imagine an, an army of 200 million descending? And there's going to be a great battle. And the Lord is just saying, and we'll, we, we can look at some of that. So uh, the Lord is giving now some directions to people as to what they should do, even... You know, when trouble comes, do we have the Lord's direction what to do? Yes, we do. So, why did the locusts come? I have to assume it's because the people were at a low spiritual state. You read about what was going on in the times of the kings of Israel. They turned to idols. They turned to fornication and adultery and wickedness. And the Lord says, now, I will chasten you. Whom I love, I chasten, the Lord says. You know, if a parent really loves his child, he won't just let them run out in the street and do any and everything. He won't just let the, a daughter go out at night and don't say when to come back. You, you know, a, a man or a woman that loves their child wouldn't do that. And the Lord was saying to them, I can't let you just turn to other gods and be wicked because we're trying to protect your children and the children to come. And so a plague of locusts had come on the land. But yet notice in, in verse 13 what the Lord says to do. Gird yourselves and lament, that is like to weep, ye priests, how, ye ministers of, of the altar. It starts with the, with the men of God. Lie all night in sackcloth, ye ministers of God. And then verse 14 
sanctify a fast. You know what a fast is? It's when you decide that spiritual things are more important than eating a meal. So let's skip a meal or let's skip a day of eating and let's seek God. And so the Lord is saying this is what they needed to do. Verse 15, <clears throat> alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And those troubles were pointing to the coming time. If you want to read something interesting, uh, go to the library and check out some books on the Dust Bowl. You ever hear the Dust Bowl? That was in the Midwest, Oklahoma. You've heard of the Roaring Twenties? And where, you know, America kind of changed and, you know, alcohol flowed in, in certain ways. And, you know, the country just really changed. In 1929, you know, they had the Great Depression. But let me tell you what was going on in the, in the late 20s in Oklahoma and Kansas and those areas. They found out that you could plant wheat. You could just plant it and the, the soil was so rich, it would just come up and you could make a fortune in planting wheat. So people migrated to Kansas and Oklahoma in the 20s. People that lived in cities, they didn't move there, but they leased land and said, you farm it, you know, I'll send the money, you farm it, because it was like, man, it was a cash uh, cow. I mean, it was just a way to reap money. So you know what they did? There was something, I think it was called buffalo grass. So they stripped off all the buffalo grass, you know, in these large, large fields. And they planted wheat, wheat, wheat. And they just thought, this, you know, this is the best thing. And you just plant it and it grows. And you get these harvesters to come in. And they, they had machinery at that time. And they were coming in and harvesting all that wheat. In 1930, the Lord turned off the valve. He turned off the rain valve. You know, you'll have a period, you know, when the rain quits. We'll plant, you know, we'll, we'll do the best. We, we're waiting on the rain, waiting on the rain. And it didn't come in 1930. Well, 1931, we'll plant again. And they planted again in 1931. And no rain. And you know what began to happen? They began to have these great, they didn't know what it was. They just looked off in the horizon and they saw all this black and this gray moving in their direction. You know what it was? It was a cloud of dust. And it was taking their topsoil where they had stripped off all the vegetation. And in that heat and dry, no rain, you can just imagine all that topsoil. The winds just picked it up and it blew across those things. It was not like snow drift. Well, 1932, we'll plant again. No rain. 1933, we'll plant again. No rain. You know, it lasted for about 10 years. And the houses, you'd see houses and you'd just see curtains flapping in the breeze. Nobody living there anymore. That was a drought. That was a drought. And I think part of the reason was, is God was just saying, those that I love, I chasten and rebuke. And when greed gets like it was, like, boy, this is, this, you can plant wheat and you can strip off all the vegetation and you can have it your own way and it's easy living. Don't think about God. Just think about that, that money. And the Lord said, I, yeah, I can't say how, why he did it, but I haven't, you know, a, a, think, a thought about it. So the Lord said, you know, I can control the rain. Today, out in California, and what is it, uh, what's, is the Hoover Dam? Where, uh, there, I think it's the Hoover Dam and the, the reservoir there. It's the lowest it's been. Somebody said it's the lowest it's been, the water level, and I don't know how they knew it, but like uh, close to 1,000 years. So anyway, God still controls the rain. And people can laugh and say, oh, you know, it, it doesn't do any good to pray. I think I ought to, we ought to pray. But uh, before we pray, you know what the Lord is saying. Uh, I need to, to get to this next section here. It, and I, I'm just going to kind of quickly go through chapter 2 because I want to get to what he says to do. In chapter 2, we get to a second part of this ruin. And this is a coming, a future event of the northern army coming into the land of Palestine. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion... 
and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. What? For the day of the Lord cometh, and it is nigh at hand. There's that phrase again, the day of the Lord. And it, I think it's talking about that northern army that he describes, and he mentions in verse 20, the northern army. And again, this is uh, verse 2. It says that there's never been a time like it, neither shall there be any more after it. Do you hear that? We had World War I, we had World War II, but God says there's, says there's a time coming that there's never been one like it. I'll tell you, folks, it's important that we know and reverence God. God is a kind, gracious, heavenly Father. But just like in the Old Testament when he was sending his messengers to them and they mocked the messengers until there was no remedy, that's where our world is going today. People don't want to respect God. In fact, in the college, on the college campus, if you, you know, give some kind of indication you are, you know, you're a God-fearing person, you're going to be ridiculed. You're, you know, by, those, by the people in authority, you will be ridiculed. And there's just no reason for that. I mean, that people, they claim they're very tolerant, but not, not of Christianity or the respect of God. So anyway, there is that future arm, uh, army that is coming. Um, and he uses the imagery, I think, of them, of, of like that, the, the locust. It says in verse 7, they shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And he's just saying it's a, it's a mighty army. In the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, it talks about that there will be, as it were, locusts that ascend up out of hell. And uh, these creatures were as locusts. And then um, Revelation 19, 16, or 9, 16, talks about an army of 200 million. And verse 8, it says that uh, they walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. In other words, they have one mind. So this is the, you know what this is called? Have you ever heard the word Armageddon? Armageddon. This is the Battle of Armageddon. And we're talking, we're talking about Joel, a little minor prophet in the Old Testament. Yet he speaks the same terms as the last book of the Bible. And God is saying, you know, I've set my watch. It's going to happen. The Lord Jesus... Now, you know, for the day of the Lord, the good news for Christians is this. There is a coming event called the rapture. And he's, there's no sign as to when it is. We do see indications that the rapture could be very, very soon. Uh, Israel is in the land. Uh, the world is coming toward one world organization. We have the UN. We have just a lot of things. It talks about there will be a one world government, and one world worship, and it won't be the God. It will be a God set up. But we see a lot of indication. But the good news for a Christian is this, is there's coming a rapture when God's people will be caught up. In seven years, there will be a terrible, terrible time setting up this last battle. And at the end of those seven years, that's when this battle happens. And the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and he sets up a throne in Jerusalem and there will be universal peace throughout the whole world for 1,000 years. At the end of that time, believe it or not, the devil again will go out and deceive nations and there will be one final battle at the end of 1,000 years. So we're talking about, number one, a rapture could come today, tomorrow. And we need to be uh, a Christian. You need to have Christ in your heart. Not just say, well, Mama was a Christian. No, have, have you and I accepted Christ as our own Savior. Mama's religion won't get you to heaven. Uncle or Grandma's religion won't get you to heaven. It has to be our choice to say, yes, I am a sinner and I do need the Lord Jesus Christ. I want him. Yes to him. And so uh, we need to be ready. Uh, so there's the rapture. Then there's the seven years of great tribulation. The battle of Armageddon at the end of that time. The kingdom for a thousand years. Perfect peace. The lion and the lamb will lie down together. Be no harm, no danger. The end, one final battle. And then the eternal state forever and ever. And it'll be uh, just a peace. So, uh, so we're talking here, this is, the, this is the ruin foretold. The, the restoration begins in verse 18. Look at this, chapter 2 and verse 18. 
It says, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Let's see here. Verse uh, 20. But I will remove far off from you the northern army. And again, that's a future. Now, how the Lord comforts his people, look in verse 21, chapter 2, verse 21. Fear not, O land. Aren't you glad for the times the Bible says fear not? And even Jesus said, fear not, little father, a little flock. It is your father's will to give you the kingdom. Yeah, hang on to all the fear nots. It's a blessing. Fear not, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Hey, he's not dead, and he's not old. He hasn't retired. He's not feeble. It says the Lord will do great things. He's still doing great things, isn't he? He's still doing great things. Then verse uh, 23 says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you, and it talks about the blessing of the land again. Verse 24, the uh, floor is full of wheat. Nothing wrong with that when God is, is honored. Verse 25 says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. And God says, I can make it up. You know, in a sense, uh, we can have a bad life and come to the Lord and he can straighten out a lot and he can restore a lot that the locust of sin has eaten in our lives. Now, I do realize, and, and you do too, when we commit a sin, it's like driving a nail in a post. You know, it's something that's happened. But the thing with sin, you can pull out the nail. God can forgive it, can he? But somebody did say, but there is still a nail hole there. You know, there, there's still some effects. But you know, God can restore joy. God can restore hearts. God can restore homes. He can restore what the locust has eaten. So let's be prayerful people. Not only that, let's be hopeful people. God doesn't take away our hope. You know, he doesn't want to take away our faith. He's still able to do great things. And I need to trust him that way, and so do you. So he's talking about how he, he com he'll comfort his, his people. Verse 27, he says, You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Spiritual renewal. And uh, that would be in verse 28. See if, if some of these verses seem familiar to you because they're quoted in the New Testament. 228, the outpouring of his spirit. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall, shall see visions. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And the Lord is talking about here, I think, future for the day of the Lord and the Jewish people. But in the book of Acts, chapter 2, when Peter preaches, they were saying, how is it that you can speak all these languages that you've never learned? And he quoted Joel, chapter 2, that the Lord would pour out his Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 and following, you realize that's exactly what he did. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, it says that you know, there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind and, and that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So God and, and so Peter says, this is the explanation. And this is why churches succeed or they don't succeed. And it's by the power of his Holy Spirit. It's not our schemes in a church. It's not really our promotions. Though those things are good, we need to plan, we need to work, but it really comes down to God's blessing on us. And that's why some churches are ble uh, being prosperous spiritually. I'm not talking about necessarily big buildings, but I'm talking about spiritual prosperity and happiness and people loving God and loving one another. And then, uh, so... He, 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 he talks about that. And then notice you will, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be, well, we would say saved, but in Joel it's delivered. But in Romans 10, 13, which we use so often, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And uh, the Holy Spirit of God said, Paul, 
jot down what Joel said. I gave it to Joel. Let's reuse that phrase again, Paul. And so in Romans 10, 13, uh, the Holy Spirit quoted again what he had given to Joel. So promises here of spiritual blessings. And we're talking about the, ru the ruin was foretold. Now the restoration is foretold and his, his wonders here of that. But you know, also it talks about, and we're going to wind it up real quick here. In chapter 3, we have two things. One, we have the judgment of nations. And we might say, why will he do that? Why will he judge them? For chapter 3 and verse 2, when he says, I'll gather them and bring them to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Verse 3 says, they have cast lots for my people and given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine. It says, because they had suffered so much at the hands of the nations. And so that's why he's going to judge them. And then as to how he judges them, in verses 9 through 16, which we just kind of mentioned, he says in verse 12, 312, Let the heathen be wakened and come, come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen. Um, round about verse 16, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion. And if you read Revelation 19 in the New Testament, you'd understand that. But notice the blessings on the people, verse 17 through 21. We'll just kind of summarize that. Verse 17, he says, So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion. Zion is Jerusalem. This is the kingdom age, a thousand-year rule. What will it be like? Verse 18 says that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. Verse 20, but Judah shall dwell forever. Verse 21, and I will, for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. And I'm, I'm glad that through the blood of Christ we can be cleansed, aren't you? Isn't that a blessing? Well, I think uh, Joel kind of gives us five points here. He talks about the locust coming, trouble is coming, and then he calls Israel to repent, number two. Then uh, number three, the nations of war will come. Then number four, God will judge them. And number five, God will bless Israel and all his people. And again, the Lord said in the Old Testament, he sent out messengers he sent him out, and you know why he sent him out? It says because he had compassion on his people. But they mocked them until there was no remedy. So it wasn't that God wanted to bring judgment. He had compassion, and he kept warning them. But they kept mocking and refusing, he says, until there was no remedy. And that's what he had to do. And the time is coming. He'll have to do that to this world. When the, when the world runs up the flag of the devil and evil and violence and brutality and hate, when they run that flag up and say, that's the flag we're going to, that's what we're going to march to, the Lord, you know, he's compassionate and he'll warn. But it comes a time when he says, there's no remedy. And we see that coming. But aren't you glad you have God if you're a Christian and you can pray and you can lean on him? And even in the joy class, we can kind of lean on each other, can't we? We can be a help and blessing to each other. Dear Lord, we do thank you for your word. Help us to understand the things that pertain to us and help us to acknowledge you, that you are a good God and that we can trust you in Jesus' name.